Humans have been listening into outer space, searching for possible transmissions for extraterrestrials for over a hundred years. Back in 1896, Nikola Tesla even claimed to have received a message from alien life on Mars. Now, obviously, that's not what happened, but the technology was new, so there's a lot of different ways that he could have misunderstood his results, including accidentally picking up signals from other experiments on Earth. Regardless, in all of that time spent listening, we have yet to detect anything that is definitively an alien communication. While there have been some potentially exciting anomalies, like the WOW signal and BLC-1, it is unlikely that anything we picked up was actually an alien transmission. But what if we were doing it wrong that entire time? We spent over six decades listening to space before it occurred to anybody that maybe we should be the ones trying to open a dialogue. That's not to say that we hadn't broadcast anything into space before. Typically, any radio wave signal, which includes both radio and television, was broadcast from the station's antenna in a sphere. This meant that the signals would also be broadcast into space, though the trope of alien civilizations watching black and white TV from the 1950s is probably not reality. Radio waves are a form of electromagnetic radiation, which means that they're made up of photons. And because they are made up of photons, they should be able to travel through space with no theoretical limit on distance. But the theory and the reality are just a little bit different. While it's true that the photons will travel through space forever, there are a lot of things that can prevent a weak signal, like television meant for broadcast around Earth, from being detected thousands of light years away. Aside from the myriad of things in space that could interfere with and either distort or absorb the signal, these radio waves also tend to spread out, making the detectable signal weaker and weaker. Actually, Finding these broadcasts would require extremely special purpose-built equipment listening to the right area of space, something that doesn't seem particularly likely. Even if they did pick up the signal, actually decoding it and finding any sort of meaning in it would be just a monumental challenge. So instead, what if we very deliberately sent powerful, focused radio waves directly into space? Rather than relying on simple chance that aliens might find and understand all the crap that we were beaming into space incidentally, what if we very clearly announced our desire to communicate with them. How would we do this, and what would we say? And are radio waves even the best means of communicating with aliens? Well, today we're going to look at the three most famous attempts to send a message to extraterrestrials, and what we, as humans, had to say. And since we've been talking about radio waves, let's first start with the most famous radio transmission sent to aliens. The very first radio message sent specifically to communicate with aliens was the Morse message in 1962. This was broadcast from the Soviet Union to Venus, and was a Morse code message containing just three words, Mir, Lenin, and CCCP. Of course, aliens wouldn't be able to read that message. They would be able to tell that it was artificially created and intentionally broadcast, but there's no reason to suspect that they would have developed Morse code. But 12 years later, the next message would be sent, and this one had a lot more thought put into it. The Arecibo message was created by Frank Drake and Carl Sagan, and it was sent from the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico in 1974. While there have been other messages sent, such as a recording of a theremin concert and an MP3 of the Beatles across the universe, many of these have been seen as publicity stunts. After all, it's unlikely that aliens happen to have a copy of Winamp lying around. Despite the subsequent attempts, the Arecibo message has remained the gold standard of radio transmissions. Drake and Sagan recognized that we couldn't communicate with the aliens through any human language. Instead, the best option was to use mathematics, as maths is a universal language. At least it is as long as you're purely using numbers rather than including human units of measurement. To that end, the Arecibo message was a radio message consisting of a pattern of two different frequencies frequencies used to create a 1,679-digit binary string. That number was important because it is a semi-prime number, a number whose only two factors are two prime numbers. In this case, it was 23 times 73. Once the message was received and converted into a binary string, if the aliens recognized the semi-prime nature of the string length, it could be arranged into a 23 by 73 tar grid, revealing this image. The different colors were obviously not encoded as part of the message. They've just been added to help identify the different sections of information contained within the broadcast. The white section at the top shows binary representations of the numbers 1 through 10. The very bottom row of white is not part of the number, but rather an indication that it is the start of a new number. While this part could be a little confusing and result in a different string of numbers, that sequence was not as obviously meaningful as the numbers 1 through 10 would be. 
This section both clarifies the notation that will be used throughout the image and indicates that most of the random looking shapes are probably numbers written in binary. And most importantly, this notation allowed the message to convey the number zero in a very clear way. The purple sequence just beneath that represents the numbers 1, 6, 7, 8, and 15. These are the atomic numbers for hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. These numbers should be universally identifiable to intelligent extraterrestrials as the atomic numbers are not an accident or the result of some arbitrary human decision. And look, in case it's been a long time since you took a chemistry class, hydrogen has the atomic number one because a hydrogen atom has one proton. Helium is atomic number two because it has two protons, and so on. And the reason that it was assumed aliens would immediately recognize these numbers as referencing atomic elements is because they are the five elements that make all life as we know it possible. The segments in green were again strings of numbers, but this time it was related to the five elements just defined. Each series of green numbers represented the chemical formula for a molecule by stating how many hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and or phosphorus atoms it contained. If you look back at the image, you'll see that there is a repeating pattern along the left and right borders, with four unique segments in the middle. This was intended to represent the chemical formulas for the four nucleotides of DNA in the center and the formula for deoxoribose on the sides. The subsequent blue part of the image is also supposed to be a picture of a double helix to further drive this point home. However, for reasons unknown, the chemical formula listed for deoxyribose in the Arecibo message is actually in correct. Fortunately, the incorrect formula was still for an organic sugar compound, so hopefully it would be close enough to convey the intended meaning. There was another mistake as well, which is the long string of white in the center of the helix, translated into a binary number. This comes out to about 4.3 billion, which was believed to be the number of nucleotide pairs in the human body. We have since learned that the number is closer to 3 billion, but they were going off the science available at the time. From there, it mostly becomes more artistic. Below the double helix, highlighted in red, we see a little picture of a human in all its pixelated glory. The white section to the right is another binary number coming close to 4.3 billion, this time indicating how many people there were on Earth at the time. In yellow, we see a diagram of the solar system, with the third planet raised above the others to indicate that the third planet from the sun is the one that sent the message. And at the bottom, in purple, is a picture of the Arecibo telescope. Aliens naturally wouldn't recognize a specific telescope on Earth, especially drawn in the lowest resolution possible, but ideally, they would recognize the large refracted lens as the means by which the message was broadcast. Realistically, most of this could be deciphered pretty easily. It may take a few hours and a team of experts, but if extraterrestrials reason in a way similar to humans, then the vast majority of that should be pretty simple. The only parts that were a bit of a stretch logically are the bits of blue and white to the left of the human and beneath the telescope. These were meant to demonstrate the scale of both the average human male living in the United States and the size of the telescope. But we can't use any human units of measurement to convey that information, so how could we convey the scale of these things to the aliens? The number next to the human is 14, but 14 what? There's only one thing in this message that could be used as a unit of measurement, and that's the frequency at which it was broadcast. The average human height at the time was about 14 times the wavelength of the message. It's somewhat obtuse and infuriating puzzle, but if the aliens had any experience solving soup cans in Mist-style computer games back on their home planet, they might just figure it out. With the message itself sorted, all that was left to do was to choose where to send it. It was decided that the Arecibo message would be broadcast to the globular cluster Messier 13. So why Messier 13? Well, a few reasons. To start with, it's within our galaxy, only 25,000 light years away. As a globular cluster, there are also a ton of stars with a ton of planets in relatively dense area, thus increasing the probability that there may be life there. But most importantly, the Arecibo Observatory had just completed some major upgrades, and the message was sent during a dedication ceremony when it reopened. And Messier 13 just so happened to be where the telescope was already pointed when it prepared to reopen. While a lot of time and careful consideration went into the message itself, the rather the haphazard method for choosing the target shows that the actual transmission was meant as more of a demonstration of the telescope's capabilities rather than a serious effort to contact extraterrestrials. Still, this remains the most sophisticated radio transmission used to contact aliens to date. But radio waves aren't the only method of communication. The signal can be disrupted or may dissipate and become too faint to detect over time, so the other two methods of contacting aliens were a bit more tangible. Instead of shouting out into the void of space, humans decided to throw some postcards up there instead to see if anybody would find them. In 1972, before the Arecibo message, Drake and Sagan had the opportunity to send a physical message to extraterrestrials. The space probes Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 were designed to be the first man-made probes that would leave our solar system, and the scientists wanted to include a plaque on them that would serve as a message to any extraterrestrials that might come across the probes. 
While the information included was much more simple than the latter attempt, they also weren't restricted to a grid of pixels like in the binary radio message. The two designed the plaque and artwork was done by Sagan's then wife, Linda Saltzman Sagan. In the top left of the plaque was a depiction of the hyperfine transmission of a neutral hydrogen atom. Because hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, and it's also the most simple, it was hoped that extraterrestrials would be able to interpret this diagram. This was included to create a scale measurement for the rest of the plaque, and one unit could be either the period frequency of 0.704 nanoseconds or the wavelength of 21.106 centimeters, whichever they needed to use. On the right of the plaque was a drawing of a man and a woman superimposed in front of an outline of the space probe. The figures were depicted nude and were intended to appear pan-racial, although the plaque drew a lot of criticism for both its allegedly pornographic nature and because many people saw the drawing as clearly emphasizing Caucasian physical traits. The man had his hand raised to give a friendly wave to whatever aliens might have found the plaque. While Sagan recognized that this greeting would likely have no meaning to the aliens, it would still show off our cool opposable thumbs as well as demonstrate some of the points of articulation for human movement. Originally, the couple were going to be holding hands, but Sagan decided that aliens might interpret the drawing as being a single creature rather than the male and female of the species. Using the scale determined from the hydrogen transition, it also depicts the woman as being 169 centimeters tall or about 5 foot 6. At the bottom of the plaque is a diagram of the solar system and their relative distance from the sun, using Mercury's distance from the sun as the unit of measurement rather than the hydrogen atom. There is also an arrow coming off of the Earth and pointing at the Pioneer probe, indicating that the probe was sent out from the third planet of the Sun. This visual depiction seems both straightforward and culturally universal to us, but the decision did draw some criticism. There are multiple factors behind why we draw arrows to point, but most of it goes back to our ancient roots as hunters. Arrows are a tool or weapon that can be used to target a location, and the arrow can only fly in one direction. If the aliens encountered the plaque with no history of hunting in this way, there's a strong chance that the arrow could be meaningless to them, no matter how self-explanatory it may seem to us. Now, it may seem like a silly thing to criticize, but the debate over such a minor detail shows just how complicated it can be to communicate with an intelligent species with whom we share no language and no culture. The final piece of the plaque was also the most important. It was a roadmap to our sun. But there are literally billions of stars in our galaxy, and we have no idea where either the Pioneer probe will be when aliens find them, so how can we direct people to Earth? The decision was made to use the Earth's relative location to 14 pulsars, represented by 14 of the 15 lines being emitted from our Sun in the center of the image. The length of the lines represented the pulsar's relative distance from the Sun, and a binary number represented the pulsar's period, using the period of hydrogen transition as the scale. The 15th line was extended from our Sun to the far right, past the images of the two humans. This line was meant to indicate the distance from the Sun to the center of the galaxy. Unfortunately, both Pioneer probes have shut down, and it's been decades since we've had contact with either of them. They have both entered what is considered interstellar space, though neither has passed through the Oort cloud and exited our solar system yet. If both probes remain undisturbed and on their last known trajectory, Pioneer 10 will fly past Aldebaran in the Taurus constellation, and Pioneer 11 will fly past Aquila in Sagittarius. These trips should take 2 million and 4 million years respectively, so we probably won't find out if any extraterrestrials discovered these plaques within our lifetimes. In 1977, Voyager 1 and 2 were launched to take detailed photos of Saturn and Jupiter, respectively. But since they were already heading in that direction, NASA figured that they may as well just keep flying out of the solar system. And this time, instead of just a plaque, they were going to carry with them a time capsule of Earth in the form of a golden record. Or at least a copper record plated in gold. The front of the record is titled The Sounds of Earth, attributed to NASA from the United States of America planet Earth. The back of the record features the same hydrogen atom transition for scale and pulsar roadmap back to Earth, and it also includes instructions on how to actually play the record. On both probes, the record came with a stylus already placed in the appropriate starting position, so all the aliens would need to do is figure out how to build the rest of the record player. Two diagrams, one top-down view and one horizontal view, show the record with the stylus attached, indicating which direction to turn the record and at what speed. The other diagrams describe how to extract the encoded images from the record, as well as showing what the first test pattern image on the record looks like. The 116 images contained on the record are an eclectic mix designed to highlight various aspects of Earth. There are photographs of the planets in our solar system, of an astronaut in space, and of planes, trains, and automobiles. Some images show chemical compositions of atoms, the number system that we use, and the different stages of the human life cycle. But there are also images of a random seashore with a lighthouse, or a woman in a grocery store, 
eating some grapes that she didn't pay for and some flowers. Separate from the images contained on the record, the whole thing also came packaged with a written message from President Jimmy Carter. And the audio on the record is just as eclectic as the visuals. It opens with a message from then Secretary General of the UN, Kurt Waldheim, delivering a greeting. That is followed by greetings spoken in 55 different languages, with the final message on that track being Carl Sagan's son saying, Hello from the children of planet Earth. After that, there's an assortment of music ranging from Mozart to Johnny B. Good to Bulgarian folk music. In addition to the actual man-made music, there are whale songs, the sounds of laughter, footsteps, rain falling, and any other human and earthly sounds possible. It's hard to explain everything about who we are as a species and what Earth is like as a planet on a single record, but the wide variety of content would at least give a taste of how either advanced or primitive we were in relation to whatever alien race finds the record. This record was also electroplated with Uranium-238 in the hope that its half-life could be used by an alien race to determine how long the record was floating around in space before they found it. Unlike the Pioneer probes that won't pass by any stars for a couple of million years or more, the Voyager probes should both reach their destination star in only 40,000 years, one in the constellation Andromeda and one in Camelopardalus. Of course, they're only going to come within about 1.5 light years of their target, so even if a species sees the probes coming, they may not be able to intercept something so far away. Now, while more radio signals have been sent since these examples from the 70s, no more physical messages have been sent, and none of the subsequent broadcasts have matched these examples in terms of complexity or desire to direct alien life to our planet. That's not to say that the 2010 message broadcasting Klingon inviting aliens to a Klingon opera in Holland wouldn't be interpreted by aliens as an artificial signal and a sign of intelligent life, but it's hard to argue that it holds the same scientific value as these other messages. One major reason for the lack of more detailed messages is the changing sentiment from many prominent scientists. While scientists like Drake and Sagan were firmly in favor of making contact with extraterrestrials, since then a number of prominent scientists have spoken out against trying to contract extraterrestrial life, but none have been more prominent or outspoken than Stephen Hawking. Hawking rightly warns that whenever an advanced civilization meets a less advanced civilization, it has never gone well for the less advanced civilization. Others disagree with this notion, especially because it assumed that aliens aren't just as shitty as humans are, but there's also no guarantees that any civilization we contact will be more advanced than us. Especially if we are simply sending messages via radio waves and are able to travel to one another, whatever species we contact might be either less advanced than we are or roughly at the same level. If they're less advanced than we are, it would give us the opportunity to share our technology with them to help them progress their society. Or it would possibly give us the opportunity to do to them exactly what Hawking was afraid they would do to us. Both species are at roughly the same level of technology. Our civilizations could help one another to further advance. We could be like pen pals, communicating through radio waves until we can find a way to finally develop the necessary spaceflight technology to meet one another. And then, because we're humans, and it's what we do, we can slaughter them all, pilfer their resources, and then declare their home planet to be Earth 2.